Welcome, everyone. Um, welcome to uh, Uncomfortable Solutions, the uh, second part of day two of the I Am the Cavalry track, and our last thing here. Um, oh, we have a closing segment. I'm sorry. Uh, I'd like to thank our th sponsors, Tenable, Protivity, uh, I forgot one already, and Amazon. <laughs> Uh, source of knowledge, yes. Uh, and all the other, Verispray, all the other sponsors, there's uh, like 30 of them on the list. Um, I, we're going to be interactive in this session, so I'll be walking around with a microphone if you want to have people hear you. If you don't want to have people hear you, if you want to say something that you do not want public, you want off the record, tell us and we will kill the microphones so that nobody outside of this room will hear you. Um, and with that all said, it's Bo Woods and uh, Josh Corman. So while usually uh, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas, at cons where they record and broadcast everything, that's not the case. But we have the power to bring Vegas, to make Vegas stay here again or something. Oh, yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Great again. <laughs> yes. Oh, no, no. <laughs> um, thank you for coming back. Um, who is here for this? I see so several familiar faces, but you chose different seats to just, just to mess with me. Who is here this morning? All right, so in the inverse, who wasn't? OK. Well, that's good. Thank you for coming back, and thank you for coming for the first time. Um, let's do a kill me if I go longer than six minutes. Don't kill me, but maybe punch me hard in the arm. Um, I'll do a short recap of what we tried to do this morning and, and how it was meant to be fuel for what we want to do now. So yesterday was really kind of Look, we turned three years old. This crazy mission seems to be working. So it was where we kind of won, like some victories and accomplishments. Where we're winning, you know, we're far from done, but we're on the right path with folks like the FDA, with folks like NHTSA, with some of the device manufacturers. We're getting coordinated vulnerability disclosure. Culture started, which is causing competitive need to, to copy. So we're, we're kind of trying to bend the arc of history. Today was meant to be really hard problems that are overwhelming us, uh, and we don't want to just wear that weight on our shoulders and, and have people watch us like fatigued to death and give up. Um, and the number and variety of these really hard problems are growing. So while we're doing a great job, we also want to be honest and candid with you of where we don't have any answers or we don't have any good answers. And if the morning was about uncomfortable ground truths, and sometimes the opposite of, another, of a truth is not an, a, a lie, it's another truth. And there's tension between, say, the need for privacy and medical devices in cars so we don't do any logging. But without any logging, we have silent failures that we can't study, capture, and learn from for forensics and for having evidence of proof of harm or evidence of hacking in cars or whatnot. So sometimes our truths compete. So this morning was about showing up. We wanted to get to a few incredibly overwhelming challenges we've encountered that don't seem to have an obvious solution. That was meant to catalyze some uncomfortable experimentation and uncomfortable brainstorming. And this is why it's not going to be a monologue. It's supposed to be. Um, we want to hear the best ideas that you all might have, that if we get out, out of our comfort zone, are there legislative responses? Are there regulatory responses? Should we do a doc documentary expose? You know, Should we have? Um, you know, consequence-free brainstorming will put all the ideas out there. They may not be smart, but we at least want to surface some of the beliefs or some of your best ideas to rise to some of these challenges. So um, the spirit is when you're a little bit behind, you work much, much harder. But when you're very, very behind, you have to work smarter and think differently. And one of the best quotes Bo and I encountered when we went to the think tank was we were talking to somebody from Germany, the German government. And she had this perfect phrase that I wish I had just come up with. She said, it's become clear to us that we need radically different approaches to IT. Not little changes, not best practices, radically different approaches to IT. And for those of you who know me for a while, my rugged software stuff, my rugged manifesto, rugged DevOps, those were ideas that said we're becoming too dependent on digital infrastructure that's not dependable. And the cavalry was really an extension of that to public safety, human life issues. So I agree, we need radically different approaches. And what I found is we have a lot of technical solutions that no one's willing to use because the incentives are screwed up. Things like no software liability, things like no software supply chain transparency, things like um, you know, the, some of the most vulnerable products we have are security products. Things like um, compliance things that have gotten in the way. 
certain laws meant to make healthcare better, like meaningful use, in some ways made us much, much more exposed. So I have some cognitive dissonance that, on the one hand, some of our biggest mistakes were caused by laws. On the other hand, if we don't hack the law and hack incentives and change liability, insurance, or these other things, there's no reason to pick up our technical solutions. You've got things like LangSec that are really clever from academia. You've got things like liability that's work in other scenarios, and we're just too uncomfortable and too uh, conditioned to think those are bad things and the government can only make it worse. But sometimes the, the cost of inaction is much greater than the cost of action. Um, so how many minutes is my into my six minutes? You are seven minutes in my six minutes. I can't math. Right. Um, you're, you're four minutes. Though. Okay. So that's the general arc is that we wanted to establish some really uncomfortable truths in the morning and then use that as motivation for us to have a sustained experimentation on, look, in the last 15 years, what really made a dent in security? I can list a few, but I want to surface some from you. And how could they maybe instruct the next innovations and leapfrogs we need to do? And the analogy I used was when we needed to, we made the Manhattan Project and we pulled together our best and brightest and we figured something out to end the war. When we wanted to, we had the space race. Like how can we put somebody in a space? When we wanted to do the moonshot, we figured that out. But we haven't had a groundswell and a public consciousness that these problems are really severe and we need these grand challenges to, to ask for the really big changes, radically different approaches to IT. And then now the slide I put up yesterday morning was from the Martian, where he was out of food, he was not going to survive being stranded on Mars, but he scienced the shit out of it. So I want us to maybe science the shit out of it. And it's going to be partly technical and partly policy, and some of us hate government interaction on tech and cyber, but let's at least brainstorm what that might look like. So let me give one of the scenarios as a recap for the people that weren't here. I'm on the HHS Cybersecurity Task Force that Congress asked for. We have 12 months. There's 20 of us. Michael McNeil from here yesterday was one of the 20. We've got some really smart people that are very overwhelmed. And what I put on the table in one of our first meetings was even though the FDA is doing a really good job helping to make new medical devices better and more secure, the clinical healthcare environments are a disaster. Um, it looks like an intractable problem. And the case example I brought up was Hollywood Presbyterian Hospital this spring was hit by a piece of ransomware for a known vulnerability in JBoss in a McKesson device that hit lots and lots of healthcare organizations. But in their particular case, they didn't pay the very small uh, ransom and it affected patient care. It affected patient delivery. They had to divert ambulances to other facilities. They almost had to move patients. And to our knowledge, no one has been hurt. But the, the probability of people getting hurt with a sustained denial of service of patient care is the reason I left my private sector job to try to go further into public policy work and accelerate the cure. And what I posed to them is I said, what if, if that was an accident where ransomware accidentally hit patient care? What would someone, is there any technical barrier to someone deliberately taking out plural hospitals? And what would we do if they did? Would we be able to fix it in an hour, a day, a week, some months? And we looked at the near-term, mid-term, and long-term solutions, and they're terrible. Like years of changes to rotate out the bad and indefensible supply chain and, and devices in these clinical environments. And worse, even when we gave them new stuff, they admitted that they don't have the budget or the stomach to get rid of their old XP systems, right? So if that's a ground truth, an uncomfortable truth, there's really no technical barrier. Someone has the means, motive, and opportunity to do significant damage on public trust, crisis of confidence, and our ability to have healthcare delivery. And specifically, if you combine it with something like the Boston Marathon attack, where there was several injured people who luckily were saved because they were blocks away from some of the best hospitals in the world. Were you to add something as simple as this readily re reproducible, more prominent than you've seen in the news, kind of denial of service, ransomware is a distraction. It's a payload. It's a symptom. The underlying disease is when Billy Rios looks at it, a device, not a medical device, but a device in a clinical environment had 1,400 known CVEs in it. So even if we patch that one, it's just we, we essentially have a public health issue. And what we're really looking for is to crowdsource your brains and your innovation that how do you secure something like that? They don't have a CISO. They barely have an IT person on staff. They have wide open networks, almost required by law horribly vulnerable individual devices. And I look at that problem and 100 of the Fortune 100 
that lost intellectual property despite having massive security budgets. One of the banks we talked to had 500 full-time security staff, and they're still breached routinely. So if we can't defend people with massive resources, how do we defend patient care in these highly exposed environments? And I'm not trying to scare you, I'm trying to motivate you and make us dwell on it for a little more than five minutes. And if that is a scenario, and we have to do a moonshot, and we have to science the shit out of this, what might that look like? All right, I think I'm out of my six minutes. You are. Okay. You're past. You're way past. Is that a good summary for the people that were here? Is it clear enough to the people that weren't? I guess I left out 30 more seconds, since if you didn't see any of this, two things made me want to quit my private sector job and go further into this. Um, Hollywood Presbyterian kind of, sh is, we knew they were vulnerable, but I think it advertised to new adversaries how vulnerable we really were. And I see a gold rush effect where people, once they see weakness, they exploit it repeatedly. It's like when OpenSSL Heartbleed happened, you had 31 other bugs found that same year. And the second thing is, when I researched Anonymous with Jericho, we did the Building a Better Anonymous series, we, we tracked very few hacking, actual hackers in Anonymous that knew what to do and how to do it. And one of them left Team Poison after we were done, Junayed Hussein, a UK citizen, he moved to Raqqa, he radicalized, he joined ISIS, he helped start the cyber caliphate, he was recruiting and training people to use Shodan, to use free attack tools. And when we know that these systems are directly connected to the internet, we know they have hard-coded default passwords, we know that all you need is the, the motive, because the means and opportunity are already there. The combination of more visible exposure and people willing to hurt us is what is bothering me and why we trust you to have this candid brainstorming conversation so we can get, try to get in front of this. But the truth is, even if we had the will to do something tomorrow, it'll take 10, 15 years to actually clean up our technical debt here. And I don't, I'm pretty certain we don't have 10 years to, to win this foot race. So how much preparedness can we do between now and a competent shattering attack? So if that's a little over the top, it's because I had to condense a whole morning into nine minutes. But uh, keep in mind that we have means, motive, and opportunity. And we've got to think of some radically different things. So I think everything's on the table from what did we do like DEF and ASLR that really took out large classes of attacks in the past? Which things can work when you don't have a security staff? Which things might require legislative or liability changes? Which things might require an expose documentary that shows how bad things are? Is there some sort of grant or government grant challenge we could stimulate? Everything's on the table, but we don't, again, we don't want a monologue. So how should we pivot from that to now? Lots of hands, that's good. All right. Uh, and reminder, if you want to shut off the camera, this is valuable for posterity, but if you want to shut off the camera, we will pause it. Nothing works better than a demo, right? I mean, we need a forcing function to help certain people understand that this actually is a potential reality, right? The, the stuff like uh, Hollywood Prez is, I think, a good demo, but we need other demos for these people to, to help them understand. Now, I think in terms of, of uh, smaller places or places that don't have security people, don't have security budget, especially in the medical sector, what about stuff like a fire drill? I mean, you go back and you say, okay, if power were to go out in this hospital, what would you do, right? If your infrastructure, uh, especially certain services were to go out, what would you do? Do you have backup systems in place? Do you have paper and pencils and things that you would do to, to handle these sort of situations if power went out? What would you do if, if certain um, IT systems were to go out? Yeah, and I should probably set some ground rules as well. Bo and I know certain things that are already done or being done, but we're gonna withhold some of those so that we can get the juices flowing for a little while. We'll pepper them in when we slow down, yeah. I think um, we have, uh, we as an industry have a, a, a long and storied history of uh, creating uh, short-term solutions that make things harder in the long term. Yeah. Um, well, actually, one of the examples you, you, that you gave uh, about five minutes ago in your speech was, was an excellent example. Sure, we created the atomic bomb to end the World War II, but then we started yeah. nuclear armament for the rest of the world right. uh, for the next 60 years. Um, 
uh, we created a we we created a a, a a solution to solve a short term problem because we didn't want to kill two hundred thousand people, or possibly up to a million soldiers, which is what the army's estimates were. It was going to take to invade Japan, um, but I think that. Uh, whatever solution that we come up with, we have to remember that uh, we can't. It can't be short-sighted. It can't be to solve this, the the problems that we're seeing now. But how's that solution going to uh, react to and be reacted to? How's that solution going to be placed in future situations? Yeah. Which is something we're very bad at doing because we often layer technology on top of technology on top of technology, and then before you know it, five years down the road, we don't have just one stack to defend. To defend, we have twelve stacks to defend, each with their own individual vulnerabilities, their own individual exploits, their own individual in uh, idiosyncrasies, and everything else like that. So, I, I think um, to flip this around into the solution, um, I, I honestly think that uh, in many cases non-technological solutions can fix technological problems. Yes. Um, I mean, everyone says KISS, and sometimes it applies, sometimes it doesn't, you know, keep it simple. Uh, it, a lot of times it's more complicated than that to be stupid about it. Um, but there's a lot of uh, uh, solutions for, well, the, your uh, 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 example uh, where an air gap system or uh, going back to manual uh, well, going back to an air gap system that, are, that requires manual updating and doesn't have to connect the internet to get updates or to get firmware updates or to talk to the vendor or anything else like that, um, which may be on the table. And, you know, the, of course, the common, the common issues with that are, well, then they never get updated because some dude has to go around with a USB stick or something else like that, which means that the device has a USB drive and if you have physical access, da 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 da, -da. Um, Those are problems that we know about. Uh, introducing devices that can connect to the internet with all new levels of firmware software introduces vulnerabilities we don't know about. Yeah, I mean, I mean maybe. So, I mean, and maybe, and maybe this, maybe part of the solution is the devil we know versus the devil we don't know. Yeah, I, I do think, and if you didn't hear this in the last couple of days, our dependence claim on the cavalry mission was our dependence on connected technologies growing faster and our ability to secure it. And that implies if you can't depend upon it, you can depend upon it less. So there's, there's plural options. One of them is there might be certain use cases that are wildly inappropriate to be connected to the internet. Um, yeah. So there are a couple things packed into his comments. And one thing is don't worry about, at this stage, maybe we'll worry about in the second half of this, this block, don't worry about the law of unintended consequences. It, it's, it's a given. We can make things worse. In fact, if you've ever been involved in a breach, it's not the breach that kills you, it's your bad response to it that kills you. So yes, law of unintended consequences, we should measure thrice cut once, all those things are true. Really we're looking to surface ideas even if they're bad because there may be a nugget of truth in a bad idea. Um, so let's just rapid fire whoever was next. Um, all right, um, so this is a clarifying question. When you said there's, there are devices that have 1,400 vulnerabilities, um, are you referring to uh, like medical devices like a pacemaker or are you referring to e-records? Because I think those may be two separate problems with different solutions. So, so there, yeah, there's yeah. a variety of devices, each with different levels of attack surface, each with different levels of complexity and code yeah. and operating system. That was not a pacemaker. Uh, okay, yeah, for, for yeah. e-records, I think, yeah. um, like, the, the low-tech solution is probably better. Like, they hate the electronic records. The people, like, like they're doctors, you know, and they have, like, office staff, and, they, like, their job is not IT. So why not have something like H&R Block for taxes, where it's, like, they just send copies of their files to this central office and like they they deal with it because it's people like the um, the new cyber task force that fixed uh, Obamacare um, why isn't there something to fix like medical records right sure. who's next a reminder uh, you can feel free to point out things that have worked in enterprise IT that had a big impact as well All right I may ask to the gentleman who was uh, speaking about fire drills um, how would we go about enforcing two hospitals this is supposed to be a dialogue right? yes uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, how do we go about uh, having these people? Who would be self-selective? Why would why would I, as a as a hospital practitioner, decide to join your fire drill? What's my business incentive? Yeah, that was that was the first part of the comment, which was we need some kind of forcing function to get these people to understand that this actually is a problem, right? Demos, right? Have have people that know how to exploit these systems, maybe that are in the room 
be able to go into these places and exploit the systems with an easy backdoor or, you know, go in there and just, just do a port scan and shut stuff down. Seems to me like going to all the different hospitals. One at a time, yeah. Going to every hospital one at a time in order to, to demonstrate that they're vulnerable one at a time when there are millions, I don't know how many hospitals there are, but millions of hospitals, right? How, I can't, we, we don't have the infrastructure to do that. So I don't know that that's a viable solution. Um, maybe uh, so we don't get stuck on this one, even though it's a great one. And we do have some ideas that we're holding back. Um, let me put that experience into maybe a, an incentive structure. So if it, for certain publicly traded companies, they have to go through business continuity, disaster recovery, annual tabletop exercises. And they have to have a play for things like a hurricane or an outbreak or this or that, and, and hospitals do this as well. They already do drills for things like a sustained power outage. So yeah, it wouldn't just be that this kind of an experience could help. It might be that there's a requirement to have a cyber play in your certification or your insurability from your underwriter. So try to connect the technical and the incentive, whether it's government incentive, insurance incentive. Um, but I like where you're starting here. But uh, let's expand it to all sorts of levers, yeah. Um, uh, I'm from Canada and we had an election last year and uh, I was coordinating the security for that. And so like six or eight months before, what we did is we actually had a pretend election. Like we opened an office, we hired people, we gave them the training, and then we threw lots of security incidents at them like jerks and then saw how badly we did on some things and then got way better very quickly. And so now they're going to do an entire simulation every year so that it's like a smooth machine for the, do you know what I mean? And like, I can't believe how much we learned from the simulation and I don't know how to motivate um, a hospital to do that, but like, like, I don't know, you practice before you go out on stage and play music, right? Like, you should practice for bad stuff too. I mean, our kids have to do a fire drill before they can leave, you know. Right. So they know where to go when there's a fire. Uh, you have your hand up? No. So I really like that you're going after policy, and I'm glad you're, you know, you guys are heading on the right path there. I think that's the rules of the world. That's where the game is going to be changed a lot. I think there's another opportunity that we should look for. I visit with a lot of C-suites, uh, level type people, and have for years, 20 plus years, healthcare, IT, and security. So what I've seen a lot is a real reluctance, even though there's several people might be identified as the accountable person that's either signing off on an attestation or whatever, there's an opportunity there to go after something that's a little more dear to them, and that's their money. Okay, so if their boards or they are not able to see their bonuses or um, we can affect change in policy that requires them to meet certain requirements before they can get their bonus, I think that might start to have an effect on IT spend and then IT security spend, and they might get a little bit more interested in the problem. So that's a, that's a, a stick approach, right? A, a, a fear of penalty. There, there could also be carrots. Hi, so my name is Suzanne Schwartz from the FDA in case, for those of you who weren't here yesterday, I wanna comment a little bit further or provide a little bit more context with regard to the suggestions that have been already kind of put on the table with respect to fire drills or exercises and that's something that uh, FDA, Health and Human Services, government working together with hospitals, with manufacturers, with others actually already have uh, uh, undertaken in terms of establishing what n is needed with respect to taking a simulation and having people go through the motions of what would that response look like to a specific kind of a crisis. We do do that all the time for different types of, you know, for hurricanes, for power outages, for electrical failures. And in fact, there have been a number of really good exercises, what are called um, beyond tabletops, but functional several day exercises that have taken place with respect to a cyber type of an attack. 
So leveraging things like organizations such as American Hospital Association, the AHA, that brings together, that's where you're able to get that scalability of getting a whole slew of hospitals across the country to participate. Um, leveraging different trade organizations among manufacturers so that manufacturers can participate in the play of those exercises also. Leveraging parts of government, and I'm not talking only about federal government, but because there is an entire um, infrastructure, we're talking about critical infrastructure here, there's an entire response mode that goes into the state and local level with emergency responses, with departments of health, with like really down into the weeds, there is that need to sort of kind of play out what might something look like if it goes bad and how do we recover from that. Um, I just wanted to share also a really kind of uh, an important anecdote that once was said to me by the person who's the Assistant Secretary for Preparedness Response, uh, the ASPR, um, and re that, that's Rear Admiral Lurie, who has said, we exercise to failure, not to futility, but to failure. The whole point of an exercise is to stress the system to the point where we don't pat ourselves on the back afterwards and say, wow, we did everything really, really great and we've got it all together, but rather, where are the gaps? Where are the learnings that we're going to need to fill in to assure that people, patients uh, do not get hurt and uh, not to lose our sense of confidence, so not to futility, but to failure, and then you iterate on that and you keep on shoring that up with new situations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think the, the blueprint exists, um, but thus far we haven't found folks that have done a cyber exercise that, that affected patient life. Um, they may have happened, we just haven't encountered many. And if they have happened, um, I don't think they have reached the whole ecosystem yet. Yeah. So we did, without saying more than I probably should, um, we did get a readout of Cyberstorm 5. It did involve some pretty key people in the industry ecosystem. And they did involve some healthcare injects. If you're familiar with how these things work, it's like a, cap, you know, it's like a CCDC type thing. Um, but none of the injects involved any loss of life. So to the, to the point of stressing, um, we're sort of working on something that might be a great demo and stressor simulation with the right kind of stakeholders to maybe catalyze some action. So that's a great idea. And there's probably other ideas as well, but simulation is a good topic area. And one of the things that I've observed if, if as we're trying to go through these is I was walking through something with uh, a colleague of ours and they were saying, well, what we need to do is to get insurers to go do this. Okay, well, why? Now we've got to go convince insurers. How do we convince insurers? Well, they're convinced by this and this and this, and you start pulling the, those threads until you find the kind of the bedrock, right? What are they in, uh, internally incentivized to go do? What's their intrinsic motivation? Once you find an intrinsic motivation, uh, at that point it becomes a little bit of a job of awareness. How do you make them aware of that? And then you unlock them to just go do that work for you, mm -hmm. right? Mike? Hello. Oh. Yeah, sorry, I have the mic. I'm from the Netherlands, and uh, in the Netherlands we are already working on it, so it might be good to, to watch it. We have a law now which states that if you, as a company, lose personal information via hack or whatever, the Dutch government can fine you for 10% of your uh, yearly revenue. So that means that you have to show <coughs> that you have done enough to secure your site when you are breached. And they are actually working on it now, and they have the law. And yeah, I'm not sure if it will work for for America, but yeah, that's that's the problem. But you have you have to say you have to state that you've done enough uh, for what you can do. So that means penetration tests, firewall, etc. Uh, and if you have those things in place and and were updated, then you cannot get the fine. Yeah, that's just privacy. Okay, but it's uh, a start, and it also affects a lot of hospitals in the Netherlands. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's correct. Yeah. That's correct. Yeah. It's can privacy. You, can you repeat some of that for the for the people online? Sorry. His point about privacy. Okay, there. Thanks. <laughs> 
I just noted that that's the EU privacy, and it's, again, it's focused on privacy, and oftentimes focus on privacy diverts our attention from security and denial of service. Yeah. So you can fully meet the EU regulation, um, which you still need, you still don't have to do for two years, and be completely exposed from a security concern. Yeah, I said something I might not have, should have said this bluntly, if he's next. Um, at a Detroit event, like a week and a half ago, I was kind of pointing out that some of the privacy advocates might be getting in the way of the necessary evidence capture, and I wasn't, I, I had a, a sticker I pulled out of my pocket that said, I love privacy. But the old joke we used to make was, you know, to thought provoke was, I love my privacy, I'd like to be live to enjoy it. But I took it a step further in Detroit and I said, I don't want to have a situation where we have a corpse with its privacy intact, right? So these, these are truths, competing truths that both matter and they both matter differently in different contexts that have to be resolved. One cannot dominate the other. And I just said it again, so I guess I didn't regret it that much. No. Okay. <laughs> uh, your turn here. All right. Uh, so I think it's every 10 years or something, the Army Corps of Engineers goes around America and looks at critical infrastructure, bridges, highways, key systems, dams, and they give a rating. Um, our infrastructure is at a C plus or it's at a D. And we've had a lot of years where we've gotten really bad reports. Bridges are rated Ds, they need rebuilt. There was one I think was at Minnesota that basically collapsed and that bridge was known to be like, it was like a D minus rating. <clears throat> and we have this, you know, the government is already going out and giving these ratings, ratings to critical infrastructure as it is and we're still not doing any action with it. So I mean, one of the big problems here is even if we figure out how to identify where there are these weaknesses in infrastructure, maybe every time a hospital's closed down and a new one's open, I know Stanford's doing this soon in California, they're opening a brand new hospital. Why not go in there and say, okay, well this is all the existing infrastructure that's probably in most other hospitals of its age. Let's go in and run like a disaster scenario over a week. Like let's have patients of this level of life you know, simulate it and run through what an attack would look like, just to give a ranking of like, okay, well, this is like a baseline of what we have in this environment. Like, how, how would it score in readiness? All right, so someone mentioned that, let me just springboard off this a little bit. Somebody mentioned a, 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 a stick, right? Some fine for, for getting it wrong. One of the things Bo and I have talked about is there are certain hospitals that want to be the exemplar, the most cutting edge, the best and most connected in the world. There's one in Canada that comes to mind. I think it was like, Hummer River or something like that, where it's the most connected hospital in Canada. Um, we talked to some people in, uh, I think, in Dubai that want to have incredibly world-class, cutting-edge um, technology. One thing you can do is you can punish failure and point out fail. Another thing you can do is we can do a reference architecture. We could go in from the ground floor and try to design a more defensible experiment that others could emulate. Because one of the things we said yesterday is there's this classic story of the Cuyahoga River in Ohio that caught on fire many times and nobody did anything about it until it was on the cover of Time Magazine, I think. But you got a burning river of fire to show how bad the pollution was and the industrial runoff was. And sometimes it's going to take that. So for sake of argument, let's say we have to wait for our burning river on fire moment for clinical environments. What do we do the next day, right? Because we will have a knee-jerk response and sometimes that response will make things much worse. So liberate yourself from the idea that maybe we can even stop these things. But what's the recommended after action plan? All right, who's next? All right, you're, you're after him? Okay. Oh, oh, yeah. yeah. Um, just thinking, trying to think laterally here. I, I spend a lot of my time in operations. That's my, my, my primary focus, security secondary. Um, and one thing that we spend a lot of time mulling over is how do you measure availability? What does it mean to be you know, in systems, what's uptime, right? Is it when a customer comes to make a request, did you satisfy it, what not? But maybe that's another lens to look at this thing through. Like if, if half of your infrastructure is down due to uh, a, an exploit or a defect or a flaw, then your capacity is diminished and you can measure over time, you know, if you've got 100 beds and you can only effectively use 52 of them, at, you know, for a month at a time, that is a way of, of quantifying, mm -hmm. you know, the, the posture and, and the particular arrangement of uh, uh, an actual hospital installation. It's like, you know, find some way of measuring. Yeah, you may have 100 beds, but on a given day, odds are you might not be able to use more than 50% of them. Mm -hmm. And that'd be a way of characterizing the problem and it pre providing a way to do an apples-to-apples -apples comparison between different organizations, say who's doing better, who's doing worse. Uh, you know, so we have some 
metric to measure progress against. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think operational metrics will be necessary. Why don't we stay on this side just for the mic movement? Um, <laughs> and then we'll go right back to you, I'm sorry. The, um, in DevOps, for example, they measure mean time between failure and mean time to respond or restore services. So they have the MTTR and things like that. I think there are already some of those in clinical environments, and we would only know under a sustained attack what this looks like, but if we aren't measuring it, we can't manage it, if, I think is your point. All right, real fast, and then. Yep, uh, so I have, I have three quick points. Uh-oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, first one is uh, NHISAC, the National Health Information Sharing Analysis Consortium, has launched a new utility called CyberFit, which was announced in April, actually May timeframe, where what they're trying to do is create these utilities for anyone that's a member of the NHI SAC to get you services at better, more effective pricing. So the first two that they're working on are shared assessments, where if you're an NHI SAC member and you do a third party assessment of a vendor and you share that through the shared assessments platform, any other NHI SAC member can go pick up that shared assessment instead of doing their own independent assessment of that third party could use that if they, if they you know, meets their standards. The second is a pen testing service. So using the power of the NHI SAC and the members, having agreements with third parties for pen testing services at a much more uh, affordable rate for HDOs and such. Whereas if they went on their own, the price might be 20% higher. There's an opportunity for a more cost effective option there. So there's more that they want, that they're planning to work on, but that was recently announced to try to help some in this space. Um, the second one is there's a group called the Cybersecurity for Healthcare Alliance. That's a newer group that formed this year. And they been going to kind of circles for what actually uh, it's going to come out of it, but they're trying to create somewhat of what Josh is saying here, reference architecture per se, where they're looking at all these different categories of security and trying to create a, a scoring system. And where it's been heading right now is to use that scoring system for your own internal assessment, kind of like a capability maturity model assessment, where you take this scoring system, rate your organization, and then you know where, where it goes, we're not sure yet, but if that gets fed up as just a, anonymous data, then you can take benchmarks on the average HDO sits here the average medical device company sits here and you can rate yourself based on that. Uh, it's very, it's kind of in the, the grassroots right now, still early stages, but it's, it's looking to get there. The, the third point was one that I heard last night uh, that I thought was pretty interesting and the analogy I put in my head, and I'm a sports guy, so apologize for the sports analogy here, is in many of the professional sports, they do revenue sharing. So there was an issue years ago where smaller NFL or, or professional baseball teams or such couldn't compete with the, the, the ones that made all the money that were in the big markets. So they created a pool of money where they revenue shared so the smaller teams had the opportunity to compete by getting some of this extra money. So I'm not saying we'd say hospitals, you have to take a percentage of your money and put it in this pot and everybody can use it. But along those lines, if there's some centralized pool of money that the HDOs can use, whether it's a, a, a fund for anybody, whether it's incentives, whether it's tax breaks for something, to try and maintain your cybersecurity level. I just thought it was a different way of thinking about it. I thought that was kind of unique. And I could see something like that feeding into insurability or risk bans once there is a need for that insurability. But there's no liability yet um, for some of it. Uh, yep, here. thank you for your patience. Um, so I'm more thinking of, like, I work at a hot healthcare network right now, so I'm a, a security engineer there. So one of the things that we're doing, we're kicking off right now is um, a prioritization level for biomedical devices because we have lots of them and we have more than we probably know about and we don't know the impact, right? Right. So, but it occurred to us that we work with a lot of doctors who do. So what we're doing is uh, starting off with tabletop exercises where we go through like, you see a patient with this and then we just run through the checklist of all the devices they hit and then when they hit one that we know we can do something for that we just say, okay, what do you do if this device isn't there? And some of it's, well, I grab the other one over there, and then it's, that one's not connected, and you know, so, but then, you know, we're starting to hit points where, like, uh, like pharmacy systems, like, what if this one's malfunctioning? Well, you know, then the nurse has got to do this. I'm like, what if that's malfunctioning for everybody? And they say, oh, well, we gotta start, you know, scaling back on the amounts that we can do, because we can only push through so many. We gotta start pulling people on staff. And so, with that, we're able to start, make a prioritization list of devices that we need to look at and see how we can better improve our defense and depth strategies for that. Because, you know, because like logging, if we could get logging just to be able to know what's going on with these devices. Mm -hmm. And like, because we get like, uh, you know, some vendors are great, 
uh, some vendors are just horrible, and yeah. a lot more horrible ones than good ones right now. Yeah. And it doesn't help that you mean horrible at logging, <laughs> horrible at just support, right? Oh, yeah, so yeah. like, like it's been pretty well known for a while now. You know, FDA said like, no, put your security patches on your thing, but you know, you still got you know people running MRI machines. They say, oh, we need to patch it, and they say no. <laughs> But when you got yeah. buildings that are built around pieces of equipment, yeah. you know, it makes it hard for me to say, you know, what's the potential of this, you know? And so, it, you know, so if we get logging in there just to begin with, as, uh, you know, or some kind of framework where you don't even need to keep it on the device, just put it out to a syslog server. You were talking about like a reference framework. If yeah. we could have some kind of reference framework that says you segment this way, you have this type of you know syslog server set up that you can ingest and then export that to some kind of sim analytics type tool. Um, that would be great. And uh, to point out, I mean, they're lucky to have a team that knows what segmentation is and knows and has yeah. security experience. Yeah, and yeah. like like I work for a healthcare network. We have several hospitals that work for us, but I'm a team of uh, three. Right. So um, while we're on this. Uh, one of the things that came up in the task force was when we were trying to figure out how do we close this gap, what are the big levers? And they said, well, we can't afford a CISO because all the good ones go to banks. And I said, well, what if the government subsidized and gave you a free CISO for three years to every HDO, a health delivery organization? I was joking. Um, and they said, yeah, the next problem is there aren't enough. We don't have enough CISOs on the planet. So there's a strategic workforce shortage. And to uh, Jim Ralph's credit at the NHISAC, he's also on the FSISAC, which is the financial services one. And he's been encouraging people that retire from banks to add two more years to their career to go work in a hospital to at least pull some of their experience. It's a, it's a clever idea, right? It's about two years he asked for. Um, and some do it longer. Um, but yeah, there's a, there's a real strategic workforce shortage too, which is part of the reason I'm, I'm concerned. So they're lucky to have you. Yeah. Who's next? I didn't see. To your first point, sir, um, it's just trying to maybe flush that idea out a bit more. Is there, are the, are the hospital, the people making the purchase orders for specialized equipment at hospitals, um, whoever those guys are, do they have access to the data of which third party vendors? So say I'm trying to purchase an MRI machine for my hospital and I'm not a tech guy, I'm just a hospital MRI purchaser guy. Um, do I have access to the data about which one's more secure? How do I, I'm, do, do they have access to that now? And if not, what's being done to use that data in an, in an intelligent way? <laughs> uh, so, well, so I'll preface for, for those who weren't here yesterday. I'm Colin Morgan. I work at Johnson & Johnson, so I'm on the manufacturer side. Uh, but um, so my understanding, that's the goal where they're headed. They want to be able to have that information shared. So for example, we, we do third-party assessments of vendors, have our tools. We do a full comprehensive evaluation of them but then that's ours, we don't share that with anybody. And most other organizations do the same thing. We constantly hear from vendors, you know, you guys are asking us to fill this questionnaire. We just had five other companies last week ask us the same thing with their questionnaires. And so there's, a, there's an assessment overload from both the vendor side plus the hospital side, the manufacturer side. We're all asking the same questions a little bit different way to the same companies. And really, what's the value of that? If we're all using a vendor for the same purpose, can't we find a common ground and ask the same sets of questions? And, get the right information. Can we, can we trust an SSAE 16 or PCI assessment, which I don't personally trust them, but um, is there something, some middle ground where we can trust components to that, share that information out, and if there's something above and beyond we want to know, well, then we can ask those questions. So we're we talking about having some sort of, say, organization that just says, uh, all the different, here's, here's a list of all the different, like I as an organization, I'm dedicated to providing intelligent assessments of all the different healthcare equipment out there. So I have one section full of hackers that just fo focus on MRIs. They go out and they audit all the MRIs and provide the data of the MRIs to the healthcare market and maybe the healthcare providers pay, pay a premium to get access to that data. Would that be the kind of thing that we're talking about? today. No, no, not, not, <laughs> yeah, and we can talk more offline about it too, is, no, not, not from that perspective. This is more of the, if you're using a cloud provider for, um, you know, data storage, or if you're using Amazon for some service, not, not anything that is your, your 
assessing a, a device and you're finding out what the vulnerabilities are and then sharing that with everybody. It's more around, you know, if I'm using Salesforce, or if I'm using Amazon, or if I'm using Office 365 and I fully assess them, then let's all use the same assessment. And if we do it all through the NHI SAC, then right. that can be shared amongst the NHI SAC. The MSD. Hold on. 